Well, good morning, DWCC. We're so happy to have you with us this morning. Hey, would you just uh, stand wherever you're at, and would you worship with us this morning? Good to see you today. Good to have you with us. Uh, we're so glad you're uh, worshiping with us this morning as we are live uh, here at Desert Winds. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, if you have not yet, uh, fill out your connection card. You can find that on the app. You also can find it on the website, dwccav.org. Uh, you'll see a bunch of tabs there that you can connect with us on. 
and uh, we want to make sure that you're doing that on a regular basis. If you're a guest with us today, this is your first time watching, uh, we're really glad to have you here with us. Uh, if you want to download the app, we'd love for you to do that. You can listen to past messages and, and all that things way back before we started doing video and all that. Um, <clears throat> if you don't and you just want to say hi, let us know you're with us. Uh, send me an email and let me know. It's Joel, J-O-E-L, at dwccav.org. Just a couple of things. First of all, I uh, want to thank all of you because uh, uh, some of you were helping us get out the word about our YouTube channel. Uh, we have been almost borderline obsessive, compulsive about getting to 100 subscribers. And uh, I'm happy to say that our friend Josh back here <laughs> was the 100th subscriber. And as a punishment, he gets to play djembe today. So uh, we thank Josh for uh, being here and, and for doing that. And now we're to 115. I mean, I'm waiting for the check to come in the mail from YouTube now. So uh, anyway, we're grateful for that. And we want you to keep watching that. We're going to drop videos there all the time, including uh, videos that you don't see on our Facebook page. And so if you didn't get a chance to see, I made a video this past week uh, kind of telling you some thoughts that I had about uh, the reopening of business and what that's going to look like and how we need to treat each other with grace and carry ourselves with great humility. Very important stuff. Uh, the last thing I just want to say is just a reminder about the hub. Um, the hub remains here to meet needs, to help however uh, we can. And uh, the best way to do that, if you're in need of anything, just send an email to hub, H-U-B, at D-W-C-C-A-V dot org. Uh, and if you can help out with the hub, whether it's delivery driver, or whatever, same thing. Just send an email to that address and uh, uh, our team will be in touch with you about that. As we go back into worship, I just want to declare something that is true no matter what. Maybe you're having a really, really bad day. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're at the end of your rope. You're ready to just run down the street and hug 100 people and just say, forget it, I'm done with this. Or maybe you're doing really well. Maybe you've adjusted, you're adapting, you're hanging in there, whatever the case may be. No matter where you are on that spectrum, this is true. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. Church, will you join me as we pray together? Father, we come before you today with hearts ready to receive whatever you have for us. Lord, we come from a variety of points today. We have some who are out of work and hurting and unable to pay bills and struggling in, in very profound and very real ways. We have others, Lord, who are very busy. They're in jobs that persevere through no matter what kind of times we're in and and uh, they're doing well and families that are enjoying their time together, Lord. And, and then we go through all those days where we struggle. We have good days, bad days, and days in the middle. But through it all, Lord, we will only thrive if our hearts and our eyes are set on you. And so today, Lord, that's what we've come to do. We've, we've come to take all the thoughts that we bring with us captive to you and to let you speak words of truth and hope and freedom to our hearts today. God, would you be glorified as we worship you now? We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me sing. Praise the Lord. His mercy.
Here's my heart. Take and seal it, seal it for the courts above. Come on, sing it again. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for our courts above. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ the only son of God begotten from the father before all ages God from God light from light true God from true God begotten not made of the same essence as the father through him all things were made for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen.
would declare. so much for who you are, who you were, and who you will always be. Father, we thank you that your faithfulness never changes. Father, we worship you, we honor you, we lift our hearts, our minds, our voices to you. We humble ourselves and we exalt you. We bow before you. There is none beside you. Father, you are great and mighty and worthy of our praise. In every season. So Jesus, we thank you. We love you. We are grateful for your sacrifice. And this morning we honor you. In your wonderful name we all say, amen, amen. amen. Well, we're going to welcome Melody as she brings forth the children's message right now. Well, good morning, kids. I miss you still a whole bunch, but I got to see some of you this week when you came by and picked up your lesson kits. So today we're thinking about how Christians care for each other. And that's really important right now when things are so strange and out of the normal. So I want you to be thinking about things that you can do. And this week and weeks before, I've been thinking about things that I could do to care for other Christians and to care for you guys while you're not here. And one of the things I know how to do is I know how to sew. And so... I started making face masks for you guys because that was something that I could do and I was able to care for you that way even though I can't have you here and hug you and love on you like I normally do. I'm loving on you this way. And so today's message is all about how we care for each other as Christians. So I want you to be thinking about that and after the service is over, run over to YouTube and watch the message for you guys today. And now I think I would like to know who wants to pray today. Hmm. Harley, tag, you're it. Lord, we care. Thank you for Melody. Thank you for the kids. Thank you for our grandmas and grandpas. Thank you for Miss Melody. Thank you for Pastor Joel. Thank you for Dorito and Preston. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know we had some issues today uh, with the live feed, and that happens. That's uh, one of the things you trade off when you go live, and we 
uh, may have to talk about that moving forward. But I do know that the feed cut off the end of the message, and I want to just give you the whole message again because uh, it's important. And when we're talking about the gospel, I think it's really important that uh, we bring it all the way to completion. So I'm just going to start from scratch again. I want to start just by sharing a frustration that I have sometimes, and I'm sure many of you have too, and that's this, that we tend to remember the things that we wish we could forget, but we forget the things that we really need to remember. I had that happen this week when uh, I had something shipped to the house for the church, and of course I went to church even though it had shipped to the house, and I left it at the house. And so I went back home to go get it, ended up getting sidetracked by something or someone, and drove back to church, got a call from Tree that said, hey, you left it at home again. So it happens to all of us, or really do. The human brain is both a marvel and a mystery. Uh, on one hand, neuroscientists estimate that if you compared the memory ability of a brain to a gig stick, it would hold 2.5 million gigabytes. Now to put that in comparison, the biggest industrial size hardware you're gonna find or hard drive you're gonna find is about 100,000 gigabytes. So the brain is about 25 times more capacity and power uh, than a gig stick does. And yet, when presented with new information, maybe a lecture, a lesson, or a sermon, uh, neuroscience shows that we forget very quickly what we've learned. In fact, uh, we learn about, we forget, sorry, we forget about 50% on average within the first hour, 70% within a day, and by a week, we've lost 90% of what we learned, which wouldn't be so bad if I could control what 10% you remembered from the message. Of course, a lot of times people will come to me after a message and They'll remember the story or the jokers, and that's fine. But uh, it, it is amazing how quickly we forget things that we had learned. And so that may be a bit of a downer, but I want to tell you that there are two main reasons why we do forget things. And number one is simply because of decay. Like a muscle, if we don't access memory, those memories will slowly fade in our minds. And the second one is due to interference. In other words, we access other memories and they become more powerful than the ones that we're trying to remember. So with that in mind, we come to Colossians 2, 9 through 15, and when we read it, we kind of think, that sounds a lot like Colossians 1. So is Paul repeating himself, and why is he doing that? After all, in chapter 1, he talks about Jesus as fully God, a description is Jesus' work as complete and effective, and... That's the gospel, and here we are again in chapter 2 learning it again. So why did Paul repeat it? And why do we have to go over it again? Why can't we learn new things? Why can't we uh, do different things? And why do we have to study the same stuff over and again? Simply put, because the gospel is the one thing that we can't afford to forget. It has to be at the top of our mind, and we have to frequently access it so that we don't lose that memory, that, that memory, uh, muscle memory in our mind that causes it to fade to the background. But more than that, the gospel is not just something to be regurgitated. The goal for Paul was not that the Colossians would be able to just recite the gospel and say it from rote memory. The gospel is to be received. It's to be understood. And so maybe as we went through Colossians 1, you received it with understanding. But maybe now, the second time we go through it, you're going to receive something much more personal, something that applies, because the sufficiency of Christ and his fullness is not just out there theology. It's something that is to impact each one of us at a very real level. And so as I get ready to preach the bulk of this message, I'm going to ask you, to be open with your heart and trust God with the stuff that maybe you've buried deep that he wants to unveil and bring you help with today as the gospel is preached. The big idea before we get to the text is this, that the all-consuming Christ is, I'm sorry, that Christ's all everything is our all-consuming. So when we say all everything, we're talking about his 
he knows everything, that he's everywhere, that he's all-powerful, almighty, that that matters to us and it changes the agenda of our lives on a week-to-week -week basis. So let's review this together as we read Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. Hear the word of God. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised, in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So today I want to go through three phases or three ways to understand the message that Paul gives to the Colossians. And the first aspect of the gospel that we want to cover is that the gospel tells us who he is. Who is Jesus? For many, when you say the word gospel, phrases like, he saved me from my sin, or he died for me, or he took on my sin and gave me his righteousness. All of those things are true, but the headline of the gospel is not my benefit. It's his identity. It's not that I was lost and now I'm found and blind, but now I see. It's that he would do the search, that he would go to such lengths, and that he has the authority and the ability to cancel sin. Many people that I meet and talk to hold what I would call an elevated view of Jesus, but not an exalted one. Jesus is respected by almost everybody, but revered by so few. The first step of the gospel is to see Jesus as he really is. There's a story in the New Testament that illustrates this so well. It's the calling of the first disciples that you see in Luke chapter 5. Here Jesus was by the shore watching the disciples, or soon-to-be disciples, cleaning their nets after a long day of catching nothing. You can imagine their frustration as they're doing this hard work with nothing to show for it. And here's Jesus, the son of a carpenter, on the side of the shore telling them to try again. Go and put out into the lake one more time, he told them. Peter's response was interesting. Peter said, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. It's that word, master. It's a term of respect and one of authority, like what you would use for a teacher. Well, we know what happens in the story. They go out and they catch so many fish that the boat starts to sink. And Peter comes back to Jesus, a changed man, because he has new spiritual eyes. But this time he doesn't call Jesus master. In the word it says he calls him Lord and confesses his sins to him. Friends, in that moment, Peter and those who would follow Jesus went from elevating him to exalting him. And their response was that they followed him. You won't follow Jesus if he's just someone you respect, but you will follow him if he's someone you worship and revere. Think about this. If you were to meet an authority and give them special treatment over a normal person that you would meet, but you still didn't give them the proper authority or the proper title, would you still not be disrespecting them? Colossians 2 verse 9 is very clear about who Jesus is. Paul wrote, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. A couple of things here. First, the text does not say that Jesus has godlike qualities. There's a Greek word that refers to qualities of deity, and there's a very closely related word that actually means the essence or being of God. 
That's the one that we see used here in Colossians 2. So Paul isn't writing that Christ has godlike qualities. He's saying that Christ is the essence or the being of deity. Jesus is God. More than that, he is fully God. If you're not averse to writing in your Bibles, I want you to circle those three words, all the fullness, when referring to Jesus and God. Because all the fullness of the deity lives, present tense, in bodily form. The meaning of this is powerful. The application is life-changing. If all of God is found in Jesus, and Jesus is fully God, then we need look no further for what we need than Jesus Christ. And if we are searching for God apart from Jesus, we are rejecting God altogether. I want to say that again because this is so important. If you are searching for God anywhere else but in Jesus, you are rejecting God altogether. You can call it what you want, the divine, the force, the universe, the power, etc. It's just another word for what Paul calls in verse 8, hollow and deceptive philosophy. And I want to point out, too, just something that, that I found interesting as I studied the text. Set hollow next to fullness, and you see the total opposite. Hollowness of deceptive philosophies has nothing inside of it. It's got an exterior that looks impressive. It's like if you've ever taken a tour of Universal Studios and you see these sets and you're like, wow, that was on Bonanza or that was on Gunsmoke. And I mean, I've never watched any of those two shows, but, but it looks like that, like, like it was a real Western town. And then you get to the side profile and it's just a thin wall. Nothing in front but fake grass and nothing behind but dirt. And that's what we're talking about with these philosophies in comparison to Christ. In, in the philosophies, it's hollow. It looks good. It sounds good. It may even feel good in the moment. But only in Christ is there fullness and the fullness of the deity. This is important, too, in a positive way as I apply it because many of us today are looking for help. You're struggling with what is, but I think as a culture, we're starting to struggle with what might be coming. We're wondering what new normal is going to look like. And can I hang with that? Is that something I can do? What's going to come back and what's not? For those of you who are unemployed, is my job coming back? Or am I going to have to learn new skills? Am I going to have to evolve or find something to make sure that I can pay the bills for my family? Many people have come to exhaustion trying to dig out of this hole that we found ourselves in, trying to solve everything and make things happen. It's a terrifying thing to deal with. But when you recognize who Jesus really is, you can release the need to be God yourself. You can stop trying to carry that burden. You can allow Jesus to be God and you to be human, to be yourself. Also, when you believe that Jesus is God, you stop expecting the people in your lives to play that role, too. I know the people who you love and love you would be really glad to know that you don't expect them to be God, and it leads to healthier relationships. And above all, if Jesus is fully God, which he is, you finally gain someone real that you can put the full weight of your life in trust on. Jesus is God. After that, we dwell on what Jesus did. In saying that Jesus is fully God, we declare that he is everything. In looking at his work, what he's done, we proclaim that he is enough. The central point of the gospel is that he did what we could not do and needed to do. That our words and actions and our lives are not means to an end. In other words, we aren't moving towards God by being good people. We are responding to the act of grace that God has given to us, which he did so that no one can boast or be prideful or say, look at me. Because to be a Christian doesn't say, look at me. It says, look at Christ 
in me. If you look at your Bibles, you can look at the list that Paul packs into this short passage of things that Christ did. In verse 10, it says, not only is Christ all the fullness of God, but it says that in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Verse 11, in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Um, thanks. Let me explain because I want you to understand this. The Colossians who came out of Judaism would know that circumcision was considered a confession of faith, confirmation of being part of the community. Here, we understand Paul's description of circumcision as a spiritual one based on the literal stripping away of Jesus' flesh, not the circumcision done to him as an infant, but the tearing away of his flesh on the cross. He did that for you and for me. Then he died and was buried. In verse 12, it says he was buried with him in baptism. We are buried with him in baptism. And then at the end of the verse, we are told that we are rising from the dead given to us through faith. So just as Jesus was torn, buried, and is now risen through faith, the requirement of death was satisfied. We die to self through baptism, and in faith we will be raised to life after death. Which about baptism is just a real quick aside, but I think it's important. Most people view baptism as new life in Christ. And it is. That's, that's the coming out of the water. But baptism is about death just as much as it is about life. It's about death to self. That when we go into the water, when we are brought into the water, we are dying to ourselves, which is what we have to do. We're called to do it so that we would live with him. The list goes on. Verse 13 says, When we were dead in sin, God made us alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Verse 14, he canceled our debt which condemned us on the cross. And verse 15, he disarmed the powers and authorities, made a spectacle of them, and defeated them. Brothers and sisters, all of that is ours in Christ. All of those things he did for you and for me without merit. He chose to do that for us and here we still are, fighting the temptation to look for something more. How could we do anything more than what Christ has done for us? I want to give you a hypothetical scenario. Imagine that before your life began, God gave you a blank slate, and you could write your own story. You could write your career or that you were a rich winner of some big contest and didn't have to work. And you could write down where you live and what your house looks like and who your spouse is and how famous you are. And, and you could write a script without any adversity. You could write a script that, that leads to you being the MVP every day of the week. All those different things. You could literally write a carte blanche script. That sounds good, doesn't it? And yet, even if you could write that story and have it come true in every way, that story still would not be as good of a story as that of the gospel. And here's the mind blower. Your best case scenario wouldn't even be as good for you as the gospel is. God's heart for you and what Jesus did for you completely owns anything you could author or do for yourself. So the gospel tells us who he is. The gospel tells us what he's done. And finally, the gospel calls for a response. Back at verse 9, you see a three-letter word. It's the word for, F-O-R, for. It's the bridge between the what and the why. The gospel is the story of who Jesus is and what he did. That's what we're responding to which doubles back to verses 6 and 7, which says this, Continue to live our lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as we were taught, and overflowing with gratitude. That's our response. That's what we're called to do. And each one of you, each one of us, listening to this word, is called to a response. 
And I want to give you several appropriate responses to the gospel based on this text. And the first one is repentance. The word repent doesn't just mean you feel bad, it means you change your mind. You agree with what is true and change your mind about wrong beliefs. So for instance, if your understanding of who he is isn't who he really is, then you change your mind about who he is and start living in accordance to that truth. That's repentance. If your what he did is not really what he did, then you start to believe that what he did was actually what he did. And your life conforms in a response to that. Repentance can be a decision to follow Jesus for the first time. And since we have a broader audience than what we normally do, I trust that there are people watching this who may not be followers of Jesus, but who are hearing these words and seeing what God has done for you and being like, wow, I want to follow that God. I want to be a follower of Jesus. Well, repentance can look like that. It can be a decision to follow him. But repentance will always be discipleship, being shaped, molded, to be more like him. We use the word with repentance as non-Christians call to faith, but repentance is something we all ought to engage regularly, unless that is we've managed to stop sinning. And if that's your story, I'd love to hear from you. Actually, I wouldn't. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we all sin, and so um, we need to continue to repent. <clears throat> repentance is a sign of maturity and growth. And this is the thing I love about repentance. The call to repentance is proof that the Holy Spirit lives in me. I don't have the repentance gene in my sinful nature. I can't drum that up. Bad feelings does not equal repentance. But when I'm called to repent and change my mind to come into more conformity with the Word of God, then that is proof that I'm a child of God and that He lives in me. And allows me, even as I face the hardship and brokenness of my sin, to know that he will never let me go. One more thing about repentance. A lot of people think it's a prayer. And that's usually where it starts. But it really becomes how you live. And the true judge of your repentance probably is not going to be you. It's going to be someone who knows you very well. Repentance reflects an increased reliance on the presence and power of God and reveals itself in how we live. A second response to the gospel is worship. As we understand the truth, we become more enamored with Jesus and have a greater desire to please him and a deeper desire to praise. For those of you who are not musical types, I have good news for you. Music holds the copyright on a lot of things but not on worship. Worship can and must be expressed in all of life, serving others or your church, learning more about him, being a disciple, praying scripture, using your spiritual gifts, discipling another person, sharing the gospel with others, and so much more. There are other responses as well, but I want to spend a moment just talking about one response you absolutely can't have, and that's no response at all. Don't hear this message and just walk away or go back to regular programming. Even if you've heard the story a thousand times, the gospel demands a response on the thousand and first time. And that's why we need to hear it over and over again. If you don't embrace the gospel today, fine, wrestle with it. Consider it. Dig into it. Compare it to the truth that you are basing your life on right now. Scrutinize it. Ask questions of it. Better yet, let it ask questions of you. Put the weight of your life on it and see how it brings life to you. I would rather you be offended by the gospel than unmoved by it. I would rather hear from 10 people who are mad about something related to the gospel 
than just a non-response. Because this message is for everybody. As we close today, I just want to share the, the, the meaning behind the title of the message, Unforgettable. Because not only is the gospel unforgettable, but the word unforgettable is the title of one of my favorite songs of all time released in 1991 by Natalie Cole. Of course, that was a dubbed-in version of the original song sung by her father, Nat King Cole, 40 years before that. When Natalie was growing up, she resisted everything musical, wanting to be her own person. So even when she did start singing, she sang rock and funk, not the smooth ballads that made her father famous. But then she discovered that she was actually at her best when she followed her father's stylistic footsteps and that the real Natalie actually came out and the pinnacle was the duet that so perfectly blended both voices. Maybe today you're a bit like young Natalie Cole, trying to make your own mark in the world, stand on your own and be yourself. But you might truly find who you are when you stop running from the voice of your father and embrace his call on your life. The gospel is the song of Jesus, lyrics of greatness and grace, mercy and majesty, hope from despair, and life out of death. The invitation is to join him in this great song in response, to participate in it, to live for it, and to have the joy and peace that comes from knowing it. When you are released from the burden of finding yourself and gaze at Jesus, you begin to discover who you actually are. Would you join me in a time of prayer? Lord Jesus, you are fully God and you have done for us what we needed you to do. We worship you. We praise you. And Lord, I pray that if there's anybody watching this video right now who is at the end of themselves, broken and hurting over dead ends that they continue to walk down, Lord, I pray that today would be the day of repentance. Lord, I pray that today would be a, repent a day of repentance for all of us as you show us what is broken in us that you intend to redeem. Lord, I pray that you would minister to our hearts this week. Keep the gospel at the front of our hearts and the top of our minds. Lord, help us to access that memory every day, multiple times a day, to remind us who you are and what you've done. And Lord, I pray over Desert Winds Community Church, I pray that you would minister to us, speak to us, and help us through this time, that you will help us to become more like you in every way. Lord, I just pray that as we respond to you, we would do so, Lord, in a way that reflects the truth of who you are and what you've done. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close our time, and this time uh, in this message, uh, this is our time to respond through the giving of our tithes and offerings and the giving of our time and talent as well. I understand we know that there are some of you that are hurting right now and wondering if you're going to have the ability to provide for yourselves. I hope you know this is not a time of guilt for you. This is not for you. This is for those of us who are able to give and can do so. And we know that giving unlocks so much of the joy of God in our hearts. And I'm so glad to be able to do that and to be able to invite you to do that as, uh, as we give to God our tithes and offerings, which you can do through our app. You can download the app. Uh, through your Apple or Android store, or you can go to our website, dwccav.org, and find the Give button at the top of the page and use that. Or you can mail the check to the church at 38117 13th Street East, Palmdale, California, 93550. I also want to encourage you, if God said something to you today in a meaningful way, 
and you feel led to respond, whether it's in faith for the first time or repentance or a change in a relationship that you're dealing with right now, would you please do me a favor and email me at joel, J-O-E-L, at dwccav.org. And also, if you need prayer, reach out to us, and either I or one of our leaders, elders and deacons, or prayer leaders will follow up with you. Just send me your phone number, and one of us will follow up with prayer and a time of ministry. Now go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you today and forever. Amen. I would sing a song to close our time out, but we don't want to drive you away from our YouTube channel. So we'll leave it at that and say God bless you. Have a great rest of the week.